words are the ultimate magical in big moves cover small moves. You all remember that? I, I brought it up a little bit. The big gestures, like a good magician, that he's already got whatever it is, a coin or something, he's already got it behind his fingers, and he's got to pull it around if he's not fast enough. At any rate, a little small gesture like that, all he's got to do is go... <laughs> and then he does this. Or as I said, I could picture, if history has not produced such verbal examples, but I could picture uh, opposing armies, and one guy, I didn't go into detail when I brought up the example, but one general, one ruler, come up with some, as it would turn out, actually meaningless movement of large numbers of troops, a big move, so that the guys on the other side, assuming they're over on that other little canole, shall I finally say no? Somebody going to write me? <laughs> and there's this great movement of troops, this big move, and let the others figure that it doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's not anything that anybody, any, nor, any knowledgeable general would be doing. And so this big move covers some smaller move that turns out to perhaps be the final blow, the telling attack. So, I know I went into it very little, but the dynamic was big moves can cover small moves. And so specifically what I wanted to try and get you to see tonight is really titillating if you live in the right part of the universe, and that is words themselves are a ultimate form, and it's a magical form of, quote, big moves cover small moves. And it goes like this, is that every word not only covers its own defined area, that is what the dictionary says is the definition, it not only does that, but it also covers any other neural territory needed by the speaker slash listener, which is the same thing. You want to think about it a second? Yeah, every word has its own, I'm calling it defined area, just whatever the dictionary says is the definition of the word. The sentence, the string of words, what anybody, the dictionary of common sense, the dictionary of prevailing intelligence at the time and place it said, whatever they say, that's the definition. So just forget that. We're not arguing. We're not discussing that. But it has another one. It's a big move. And the, it is the ultimate big move. That is the word, parentheses, S. But the word not only covers its defined area, but it will also take in any other neural territory needed by the speaker or the listener. Now let's see if I can't make up examples. If I can make that up, I can surely make up some kind of example. All right. Okay. TV studio, talk show, they're discussing... Here it is, circa 1989, and it's popular again now. Satanic influences. Especially with teenagers, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> regarding teenagers. So let us say that we have, you know, all the things about playing heavy metal records backwards and kids supposedly taking up devil worship. I don't know where they get it. But we have this debate. <laughs> well, what I was really thinking was the rate of literacy of most teenagers now. <laughs> I came, I was thinking that would be a pretty shoddy attempt at devil worship. <laughs> but at any rate, back to the main subject. So let us say that they're having this debate. They're having this debate and they have a good fundamentalist Protestant minister. And uh, let us say an attorney from the ACLU which I think you also have to be an atheist to work for them. But a, a humanist, <laughs> humanist, atheist type. And let us say we had uh, a law enforcement, a detective. 
and the commentator of the talk show, he builds up something that, for instance, that uh, lately we have had several churches and synagogues and schools have been defa defaced, and it's been uh, all kinds of weird symbols and saying uh, the devil's a groovy guy and all these kind of things. And so, uh, as many people suspect, there is uh, some kind of reoccurring satanic influence running through many of the teenagers' lives at this particular time. And they discuss it for a while. Now remember the subject where I started this. So let us say that somewhere along the line, this Protestant, this fundamentalist minister, and I'm just, a, as always, which is my and your privilege, it's life's privilege, to speak in a way archetypically of the people. So let us say that the fundamentalist minister is the less glib of the three. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And let us say that, that verbally he seems to almost get overwhelmed by the ACL attorney, which being an attorney, he at least finished high school, and the announcer of the show, he's got to have a pretty quick tongue, and let us say the law enforcement officer, who may not be all that verbal, but he's probably packing a gun, which you know, has some effect. <laughs> what he says is... So let us say that after some time and some discussion, I'm not going to any further, you can piece all this together, that let us say that and I say they're doing it in an audience. And the fundamentalist minister, it reaches a point that he almost has to admit that the term, the word, satanic words, but the word satanic influence or satanic you know, may not be exactly it. I mean, after 15 minutes, the ACLU lawyer, ACLU, an atheist, I'm not picking on the ACLU, our attorneys. Although God knows they, never mind. <laughs> that the atheist is just almost made the minister begin to gag on saying the word until the minister gets to the point, and maybe even the uh, chief of police there in that town has reached the, the point of listening also to this atheist of saying, well, I don't know, kids, you know, get a few bennies in them or they get a few beers and this stuff about the devil's a groovy guy or trying to draw these satanic you know, I don't know. I, I, I've caught some of these kids doing it. They try to do some good homes, and it would just seem like a joke. If it hadn't been that, they would have just written something nasty. Now, I'm not so sure that there's anything to all this. And then the ACLU, the atheist, he gets into, well, this kind of stuff's been going on forever. What do kids know? They're not doing anything. It's just a kind of rebellion. And for somebody like this minister to get all upset and holler, boy, Satan's you know, here on this planet again, running loose. My God, this is the 20th century. How long are we going to put up this kind of anachronistic thinking? So let us say, follow me, because I'm trying to get you to see something. Not me just furnishing the crude punchline. But let us say it's finally to the point. Just everything wired up at that situation, sitting right there at that time and place in that TV studio, that the minister is finally to the point that almost he cannot defend the original definition he had in mind, the, the dictionary definition of satanic. And so it may be the point. All this happens, and somewhere halfway through the show, this minister finally says, all right, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you people don't want to deal with the term satanic influence. I'm not going to push that term. But you've got to see that there is, in man's nature, the inclination under certain conditions to behave in an uncivil manner, in an unchristian-like, in an unJewish-like, in an uncivilized manner to go out and defame somebody else's house of worship, for them to do naughty and evil things. You've got to understand that. I mean, if you're going to call it some kind of a psychological problem they have. So if you people are going to argue, satanic, you know, don't, don't get misled. I'm not going to stand here and keep arguing with you over that I insist that you've got to use the term satanic satanic influence. Just look at it as there's evil in the world. Now that would sort of, under three-dimensional justice, that would sort of put a crimp or change the way that the conversation, the debate had been going. He moved into a territory necessary and he is thinking. His neural activities are still thinking that is, the energies, the chemicals, and the electricity are still operating the same way it was when he was talking about satanic influences, and now it's as though, due to pressure, that he has backpedaled to the point of saying, all right, I'm not going to insist on that term. 
But let's don't get off the subject. Just because you people, just because you being an atheist, which you may be a fine fellow, but just because you're an atheist and just because the chief of police here says he's not at all certain, he's never seen a devil, and he's not sure what all this is about, all he knows is vandalism. And he knows that there's a city ordinance against us, and it's a uh, misdemeanor, and he doesn't care what caused it. All right, so if you people don't feel that way, and so it sounds like that he is abandoning the word, the word that in its original defined area of what it meant. And so he says, all right, we can call it something else. If you people just want to call it uh, uncivilized behavior, if you people want to call it that. But see, he has made an internal move into the state and the, the area and even drawn in other territory that he is now saying, all right, I won't have to call it that. If you guys want to call it something else, I'll call it something else. But let's stay on the subject. Let's don't lose sight of what we're up to. All right, I'll make up another one. Now, you know, some of you begin to see this in a minute. It is really, really tricky. That's why I call it magical. Two lovers. I mean, something apparently happens of, the one of them thinks of no great consequence. The one of them says, uh, all right, I'll be home this afternoon, uh, but when I'm asked that, when you be home at the regular time? And no one says, well, yes, I'll be home between 5.30 and 5.45 as usual. Okay. So the one who asked, the one who was staying home, is fixed up a surprise party in anticipation of Guy Fawkes Day coming up. <laughs> and the other one does not come home until 8 o'clock. And all of the specially prepared Guy Fawkes food is now spoiled. It got hot or cold or whatever that kind of thing does. And so the other partner comes in at 8 o'clock whistling. And the partner that was stood up has to point out what happened. No one goes, well, I didn't really know somebody. I met an old friend. And no one goes through a few little songs and dances. And then verbally, this is the word, says... It may not seem like a big deal to you, but I feel very betrayed. I am very hurt. <laughs> now, it is not just the definition of the ordinary area that I'm hurt. The angry lover, in a sense, is now also moved into territories and is referring to in their own brain unspecified complaints. Maybe all the complaints that they have had up to this point against the other partner. But it comes out at what seems to be a very specific time in one area. Like in this area of you not showing up tonight on time. It, it's just like a supreme hurt to me. That you, that you just did not, you didn't think enough when, once you told me you'd be home. That it was important enough that you would even call and say, well, I'm not going to be home. I remember that you asked me specifically if I was going to be home. And as it turned out, I ran no friend, so I wanted to call you and tell you that I will be late. Because I, I don't like for you to feel as though I misled you in some way. And you didn't do that. I feel really hurt. They're not saying, I feel hurt. It is an unspecified. They're going into neural areas in their own brain, in a sense, of every damn complaint they have ever had with the other party. You don't see the magic in this? You do it, everybody is wired up to do it. It's part of the magic of talk. Because you say one thing, and the other party, see it's not, remember I said in the beginning that it, words cover not only their defined area, but then all necessary neural territories that the needed by the listener slash speaker because they are the same thing. There's no way out of it. You can either be saying it out loud to somebody else and you listening to it as you say it and it covers what you mean for it to cover. Not that you plot it, but it covers that which is necessary in your neural activity. Then, so you're the talker but you're also listening. Then the person that you said it to, they hear. And let us say that they hear in some sense if they are equally as educated and from the same time and place as you, well, I say if they hear what you're saying, they know the general definition of hurt or betrayed. So they hear that, but then they also hear into neural territories necessary 
for them to remain stable, for their neural activities, their chemical activities that are them intellectually, they hear something else. This is not miscommunication. It is not that, well, you don't know what hurt is. Now that kind of manifestation comes out. It just becomes a secondary song and dance. It becomes a kind of secondary hobby amongst people. It can happen in business affairs. And one person says, uh, I hear that you're in such and such business. The guy says, yeah. Well, would you do so-and-so for me? Or would you recommend somebody? Would you do so-and-so? The guy says, yeah. And it turns out that the two people are wired up in two different ways. And what seems to be the outcome, the one says, all right, now I'm going to pay you X amount of money to do so-and-so. Right. And then so-and-so does not get done according to the payees, not just the literal definition, but into the territory of, well, you, you did the job, but you took too long. Another person is wired up in such a way in their neural territory that that is meaningless to them. Or, you, well, yeah, you did the job, but I don't like your attitude. I came to pay you, and you just treat it like, well, give me the damn money. It would seem to be, out in ordinary life, sociologically, anthropologically, <laughs> psychologically, there's all sorts of talk about miscommunication. Or people believe, well, if somebody says one thing and somebody else hears something else because they had their own subconscious agenda and all that. That is childish mapping of the area. It reflects a kind of more basic reality. It's what I'm trying to get you to look towards. To deal in ordinary talk is to draw in not only what you say, but it's also in a non-specific, unrecognized way, it is to draw in all necessary corollaries, peripheries, and associates. It's to draw it in, all of that is necessary to fuel your current neural moves and to help stabilize your current position. <laughs> your current position being your energy status. But as always, we almost have to talk about some verbal dressing of this. It would seem to be your state of mind or the way your personality operates. But you're pulling in constantly. You're not saying, you and everyone else, I'm using you in the generic sense, you're not simply saying to someone, well, you cheated me. Or you disappointed me in our business deal. Or you disappointed me in our social relationship. It's not just that. You are incidentally mentioning many other things. And specifically what you're mentioning that nobody notices every time you speak. Sometimes it seems to be of no great consequence. And if you stopped and tried to do this with every little thing you said, it might become very interesting. But you need to be aware of the fact that even when you are apparently speaking of something specific, if it seems to be of real importance to you, which of course if it seems to be of real importance to you, if it's a big deal to you, it's a big deal. And that's it. There's nothing else to be said. But if it does, and you say something very specifically, if you tell somebody, well, now I did not get the bargain that we agreed upon, or you betrayed me, you hurt me, it can be something apparently very specific that the other party has got to understand. As far as I'm concerned, you cheated me. You hurt me. You betrayed me. And if you stop and suddenly jump in another person's nervous system and say, you, you understand what it, the person's saying? Oh, yeah, I, I know. But they're not saying that. You're not simply saying, you hurt me. You're saying everything else. It's a magical big move internally. But see, it's the opposite. It's inside out. I suggest that the ordinary intelligence would have thought this example to point towards because this happens internally. It's not externally of the magician going through some great gesture over here to distract you while he does a small one over here that is the trick itself. That is not the way it happens with words. It does not happen. It can. I'll get to it in a minute. You can make great verbal gestures to cover up something else. But what I'm talking about now, the really ultimate, the real magical in the three-dimensional world is the big is inside. The big is invisible. 
the VIG is beyond people's, even the speaker's, normal recognition that apparently you're making a little move. But a little move is not necessarily a bad move. A little move can be a very good move, such as saying, you hurt me. Short sentence, you hurt me. Three words. Real short, you hurt me. Right to the point. Not a whole lot of adjectives and adverbs and mishmash. You, you just say, you hurt me. Do you understand what I'm saying? The person goes, yeah, yeah. You hurt me. Nice and small. But there's a big move. There are big gestures going on that render this almost a, well, to somebody attempting to travel, to break away from gravity. That is a minor, minor, <laughs> minor consequence. Because you just said what you had to say. All you're doing is repeating the dictionary. That you do in some way cover the defined area of the word or you wouldn't use the word. But that is, that's the little small move. The big move is you draw in every possible association, every connotation, things that would be insane if they could be suddenly brought to verbalization, which is on a crude level, if you want to notice, is back in the 20s is what they were playing with for a while, the uh, Dada artistic movement they thought of trying to bring the kind of unspecified, they thought of it in a Freudian sense of some kind of unconsciousness to bring it into a manifestation and combine it with actual, visible, sensual works of art in some way. But at any rate, that was a little thing that came out of life and popped up historically. But what you are doing is you're covering up of a big move that no one knows. You don't even know it under ordinary conditions because you're not simply saying, you hurt me. With all the words, let's just assume that both of you are fairly sane and pretty middle class intellectually, wired up pretty generally, that both of you, the speaker and the listener, understand what the word you means, hurt means, and me. You hurt me. <laughs> that let's assume that both of them go, all right, we understand that. The defined area is covered but there is a big magical move going on because to say you hurt me you are drawing in and all you got to do some of you just but now you should be able to think about it and realize you're constantly your words your own chemical brain activity does not form these little things that go you hurt me <laughs> now if you don't know any better if you're limited to three dimensional earthbound consciousness that's true enough but you did not construct, you did not sculpt this little sentence of you hurt me. Minutes, hours, in a real sense, went on for you to form that sentence your whole life. 30 years went on. 20 with this person or 17 with this person till you be staying there right then and to say, you hurt me. That's nothing. But it may appear to be everything. That may appear to be the final straw that broke the relationship. That may be where both of you remembered, well, it all just fell apart. And that time you stood there, I didn't realize it was that big a deal, but I remember you stood there and looked at me and went, you really, you hurt me. So it would seem to be a big deal. But it's not a big deal. The big deal is the big move does not recognize that every complaint the speaker had with the other party, that the aggrieved had with the aggrieved war, Everything that had happened in one's life, forget psychological and all that, the flows of energy, the ways in which you have been wired up and what has run through you and what you have transmitted and transformed all these years is to the point that at any given time you're apparently making very small, obvious, visible moves, oral moves. You hurt me. The real magic is there is a move so big that it's incomprehensible going on. And it actually hides this. It hides itself. Because it seems to peek out like from under its own verbal dress and go, here I am, three words. And everybody goes, well, okay, well, I, can, I may not agree with it. I may want to debate it, but at least I know what's going on. It is so big you can't see it. Well, here's how big it is. It's as big as your own brain presently. <laughs> And when you go back to my example, you know, if you're trying to find the limits of your own brain, 
and you can't do it. Or to tell the, the yard that is fenced in that it can't go anywhere, that it's fenced in. And its intelligence runs around the periphery of the property. The intelligence, the electrochemical energy is the fence. And it runs all the way around and comes back and it says, I looked high and low and there are no boundaries. There, I am not fenced in. You, know, you are the fence. <laughs> when things are as large as your own brain, you can't see them. It's just simply not possible. You can look high and low. You can even look low and high. Left, right, any way you want to. But if it's as big as your own brain, you can't see it. That is part of words again is to change the apparent proportion, to change the scope of things. Uh, it is that words can apparently constrain, they can constrict, like turn apparent universals into locals, or they apparently like to help protect their own position, can turn locals in a kind of energetic defense, they can turn locals into kind of ephemeral, theoretical universals. <laughs> Which everybody does. I don't know if I'm going to go into that tonight because it sounds too psychological, but it's like self-justification if we're going to describe it psychologically. Or, there's a great old teenage cry, hey, everybody does it. But it's like turning a local into a universal. Like, don't hold me responsible. Everybody does that. Words change the scope of what's going on. There is, as long as I'm here, we might as well get this out of the way. Some of you may choke. But this is right at it. Our Friday law. This is probably for the month, if not the year. If it gets some of you good, maybe I'll just skip on like I didn't even say it and go to something else. But here it is. Talking about something makes it sound more serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. From any ordinary view, tell me this. Now just tell yourself. I'll do a piece of business. Is there any thing serious in life, in your life or in life in general, anything serious that you have never talked about? <laughs> and talking about something makes it seem more serious and as long as you are actively being used to transmit the kind of energies inherent in whatever it is then the more you talk about it it continues to fuel it it continues to support the seriousness of it if it reaches a point that is no longer validly feeding the serious aspect, that's when you lose interest. This is really like a great smog. It touches everything and things that no one ever suspects. There's no one's wired up to look at. All right, let me take some. Since all of you, I assume, are now a bunch of dyed-in-the-world heathens, at least you can turn on TV and you can see good fundamentalist ministers. You can see priests. You can just think back to your own childhood and rabbis. What is so serious in you know, their field is what they call it. It starts with an R. Not rutabakers. Religion. <laughs> I mean, you're accustomed to think, if I said, what's so serious about religion? If you were ordinary, I'll speak for ordinary intelligence, they would say, well, hey, that's a serious business. We're talking about perhaps the ultimate, the original creator, or the, our final judge, you know, the big guy. Think about it another way. 
if religion, as the general nervous system is wired up to take it, if religion were really that big a deal, really that important, would it be as serious a matter to you and everyone else, to the whole part of your nervous system, if you had never heard it talked about? <laughs> All right, I'll give you a hint. No. <laughs> And what's going on that a minister or a priest or a rabbi or just a shaman out in some village, if they were talking that much, of course, by then he would have abandoned that name and give himself probably a doctor's degree in tree bark or frog pine slime or something. <laughs> well, that's the first thing you got to do when you start coming out of the tribal area is you got to give yourself a degree. Of course, it's good if you've got a brother-in-law in another village. He'll send you a degree from his. He'll make up a school. And then you send him one back, but that's another story. That's how I got my... <clears throat> Edit that out. You would think that the matter... Now, let me speak again for ordinary intelligence. That, all right, religion is some kind of serious matter. Is that what's going on? And I start off with a, what should be a pretty viscid example. I can think of some that should be easier. But ordinary intelligence has historically taken religion as serious business. You're talking about a matter of life and death to most people. So they're wired to think. But if it were not talked about, would religion be serious? Put it to you another way. Why is it that week after week, for now for at least 2,000 years, let's pick on Christianity, you've had at least once, well, hell, more than that. I was going to say once a week, but they, those people meet a whole bunch of times a week, right? <coughs> Copying us. That's what they're doing. But all these thousands and thousands of times they meet, and they got this one book, and they keep reading the same stuff over and over, and they keep talking about the same stuff over and over. And there's a whole cottage, or probably a super cottage industry now of people trying to take that same limited book the Old and New Testament and they keep writing variations and they sell them to these ministers to you know well here's a way to do it this is just you think well now they've said everything possible about this but it's not the words themselves that would be the small move it's the seriousness of it don't you understand the seriousness consider also if you want to take a real side jolt right quick let's take the uh, Catholic Church talking about serious matters and you have grown men dressed up in these funny little hats and dresses and all kinds of lacy things and they got you know, <laughs> things on their head and they're waving and yet they're talking about now that they speak in English serious matters I tell you again to talk about something makes it sound more serious you would think that if there was some great message coming from the gods or the spirit somewhere, they would send out one message, right? Even if it was going to come through the Pope or the head rabbi, and they would say it. But it's like that the gods don't know. Or else they won't tell the guy, you know, the, the man that you look to for spiritual guidance. And so three times a week, or at least once a week, he has to come out and talk about what's going on and what's going to happen when you die or what you should be doing now. And it's always serious. I'll repeat for you again. Talking about something makes it sound more serious. And so week after week, year after year, centennial after centennial, they talk about it. And it seems more and more serious. And it's not just verbally. I was going to offer some perhaps weaker, looser, more everyday examples. Remember, we're still talking about the unknown law that talking about something makes it sound more serious. Philosophers, teachers, teachers in school, public schools, in college, you go pay your money to go somewhere and be instructed, trade school. Is it not serious? You went there to get your degree in medicine, law, anthropology. It's serious. And they will continue to reinforce us. They will now tonight we're getting to a very important area. This quarter is extremely important. That is extremely serious. 
How about parents? Being a parent and instructing your child? Have you ever seen a parent be less than serious? I mean, an instruction. I'm not talking about just fooling around and playing ball or something. If you're going to tell your child something and your parents with you, now you look here, young lady, now you sit down, we're going to talk about this. That is, if I talk about it, it'll make it sound more serious. And they talk about it, and it sounds fairly serious. They say, I don't think you realize the seriousness of this. Let me tell you again. And they tell you again. Lovers? You mean the world to me. Oh, you're just saying that. But the person looks kind of coy and goes, No, I'm serious. Really, I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> Talking about something makes it sound more serious. All right, so priests, philosophers, teachers, parents. Well, hell, all right. Everybody. Are you satisfied? <laughs> Forget those little chintzy examples. Everybody. Whatever you talk about. And do I have to point out the obvious? What do you talk about most if you're ordinary? working on my autobiography <laughs> I can't type and it's known not as actually my life but me talking about my life because it's serious I'd like to talk to you about it but that reminds me that reminds me did I ever tell you the time that I was living I stayed in France for a while I, sit down man let me tell you this <laughs> talking about something makes it sound more serious talking about you makes it sound more serious and ordinary people. Life is wired up in such a way, you surely understand by now, that out in life, everyone does not walk around looking like a sad sack. But you do understand that people take themselves seriously, not in some neurotic sense, but they take themselves seriously. Their opinions, you ask somebody's opinion, you ask somebody directions, you ask them for, some, they have any suggestions. Or you say, well, have you ever been to France? What do you think? What do you think of the French? What do you think about Europe when you've been there? People take it seriously. And one way to, to make it seem more serious is to talk about it. We've got to turn the tape over. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Kinetic art. It's like a musician, art kinetic. Take it, Art. Would that be an attempted Alabama would be hip joint, the first jazz club that they opened up in Alabama? They're around a few people. They got one guy, let's say, that starts it, and he came from somewhere really hip, like Indianapolis or New York. So they're playing along, and the, the first chorus, and he turns around, turns around to his, you know, one of his side men there from Alabama, he says, say the guy's got a sax, and he says, take it. And the guy picks up the sax and walks up. <laughs> That brings up more interesting levels of potential complexity. Who's the dumbest? Somebody would do that or somebody would stand here and make that up and tell it? I don't know. I'll figure. Are we ready? I'm going to press on, but I am... I try to give some hint. Some of you should be able to move in all kinds of directions with that. And it's not just a little one-liner that I just threw out. And as always with the good stuff, I can speak for some ordinary intelligence and say, well, that you could hear it and go, well, that is so obvious, that's so simple, I don't even see, you know, there's nothing else. It's like swallowing a noodle. You got all the nourishment. I don't know what else to do with it. Or some, or some of you could, some ordinary intelligence could be wired up in such a way as to go, the words, I hear the words, and so you must mean something else. And, but Jesus, I can't figure anything with that. 
It's right, it's everywhere. There's really nowhere to look like some specific area. It's just here. That talking about something, notice something includes anything. Talking about something makes it sound more serious. Now it doesn't matter what it is. And that is part of life, but nobody notices it. And if I start pointing out like I was doing and playing both parts there for a minute before we turn the tape over, you could fall into the former category that I was playing or referring to as ordinary intelligence. Say, well, sure, that's obvious, but it's not obvious. You would take it as being, if your ordinary intelligence is either being some kind of one aspect of cause and effect, and it's not. It's the water in which the fish swim. It's the air that you breathe. It is the chemistry that runs your brains. You talk about things seriously. But if I said, all right, people talk about death a lot. Or if you had your husband or wife or mother to die, and you're ordinary, you'd be inclined to talk about it. And you could say, well, yeah, because it is serious. And then if I say, wait, did you listen to what I just said? And you go, wait a minute. You're trying to just play a word. You're saying, I heard what you said. You said that talking about something makes it sound more serious. But death is serious. And so don't tell me that me talking about it makes it serious. It was serious. All right, wait a minute. The more you talk about it, the more serious it becomes. You think I get ordinary intelligence somewhere in you to go, well, almost. Well, I could say this. Well, if you really feel like you're suffering from, the de from this death of somebody, the more you talk about it, does it make you feel good? Well, would you see that in a sense it makes you feel worse every time you talk about it? Well, you know, well. All right, could you change worse? Could you get somewhere close to serious? No. How would humans take any secondary matters seriously if they didn't talk about them? You do not have to talk about primary matters. People only discuss dining. People do not discuss eating. People discuss love. They do not discuss fucking. People discuss their residence. But people do not discuss shelter. <coughs> the wet brain does not discuss. At the primary level, you're beyond small or big moves. And it's beyond any idea of serious or not serious. It is the minimal kinds of energy and attention that you must pay to your own energy to keep you, your collective organism, together. As if you had a choice. But all of the secondary affairs, for you people getting this on tape, this is no attack on secondary affairs, the affairs of man, having cars, having a nose job, having hair transplants, having a hobby, collecting stamps, worrying about the past, worrying about the future, breaking up a relationship, all of the stuff is secondary, just from one ad hoc, irrelevant, immaterial view. But notice, you can surely hear this, no one could take, even ordinary people, could not take any secondary activities seriously if they didn't talk about them. Now, I can give you a second. Think about it. Some of you, it should strike you. There is no way, there is no secondary activity of any kind that you could take seriously. And by that, if i got to drag it any further, if you didn't take it seriously, that is, the energy didn't flow through your brain in such a way for you to take it seriously, you would not pursue it. You would not be involved with it. You would not be transmitting the energies inherent in that scenario, in that hobby, in that activity. But you could not take it seriously. There is no way that you could have a secondary interest and not talk about it. If you had it, it would just simply be a fleeting thought. you got to talk about it. It'll never be serious. And the more you talk about it, the more serious it sounds. You know, I heard some of you people laughing at stamp collecting. I heard that the other night. But, no, all right. No, now, before you, would you sit down a minute? And I heard you talk about your hobby. Would you just sit down because you're intelligent? I bet you'd find it of interest. And the person sits down, and sure enough, they talk enough, and you're sitting there, and you begin to think, well, I'll be down. Maybe I'll look in the stamp collector. <laughs> now, ordinary intelligence could say, 
with a person set down with an open mind and this stamp collector, a philanthropist, or whatever the hell they are. <laughs> you, ordinary intelligence could say, well, you sit down with an open mind and the person started pointing out the thrill of chasing down rare stamps and just the visual joy of some of the fancy ones and that in some way they showed you that it could be a rewarding hobby. That could be true enough and untrue enough at the three-dimensional level. What I'm telling you is this. Talking about something makes it sound more serious. And so if this other person would sit down that was laughing at stamp collecting, like talk about a ninny hobby, <laughs> if they sit down long enough to seriously listen to the person extol the virtues and the joys of stamp collecting, they will cease having the same kinds of negative energy. That is, they will cease to take it as frivolously as they did. And you can, but get past the point of, well, in some way they saw, thanks to this guy's intellectual telling of the hobby, that they began to see some potential. If you can see this real quick, it was just the mere talk of it. That the listener, talker and the listener, but in this case, apparently the listener, this other person, sat down and seriously listened to the serious talk of the talker. They may not take up stamp collecting, but when they leave, they feel that now there is some validity. Read seriousness to stamp collecting. Talking about anything. I'll change the sentence then from something. Talking about anything, but something. My first version is always the best, in case none of you figured it out, because I told you everybody's. The first act's always the best. But talking about anything makes it sound more serious. I don't care how silly it was. It could be the silliest thing you ever heard about. If you hear it talked about enough, it is no longer silly. It becomes less and less silly. And you could explain it. I can sit here and do it again. All right, stand here. And you could say, well, you just get a custom. It was silly to see men dressed up like that and going out there, throwing around this ball and hitting it with their head. You know, what kind of game is that for men? Why don't they play football like God intended? They're wearing little shorts. And they can't even pick up the ball with their hands and run into each other. They have to hit it with their head. But then you keep hearing about soccer. You keep reading about it. And you see it. And you hear announcers. And pretty soon you're no longer laughing. You may not become a great aficionado of the game and psychologically if you were just childish earthbound people you say well familiarity finally breeds a kind of acceptance you no longer laugh at anything if you met somebody who had a nose the size of a watermelon <laughs> after you was around him three or four times you could probably cease going <laughs> it's more than that <laughs> and I've told you what it was Talking about something makes it sound more serious. That's why everything that is not absolutely <laughs> wired to the floor, primarily re re required of humanity, has got to be talked about. Or else you would not take it serious. There's no way you would take the idea of a God outside this system, of some figure, a Jehovah or an Allah, of some figure, or your your grandparents, that part of your nervous system at least, many of them actually believed, they thought. The picture was already going through the nervous system that it's actually a guy. Now if they're your grandparents now, or more contemporary, they may say there's a girl, a woman. <laughs> but the thing was that it was an actual person. A something. If that was so, if that was just the reality, and you would think, throwing yourself back to that day and time, that that's got to be the important piece of information in the world, that there is a God that created us and he's going to judge us when you die and that determines whether you get a good payoff or a bad payoff. That would seem to be that that's more important than whether you get your car paid for or whether you can afford a nose job. So you think, all right, that's important. So if that was important, though, that is serious, why did that, that piece of information come out? That there is a God and you better watch it. If that was it, what else do you need? No. Somewhere on this planet, every minute of every hour since you've had recorded history, there's been some shaman, some priest, somebody out of work that suddenly decides he's a preacher of some kind or speaking for the gods, 
Not that they're not that they're in some way conning you. It's life doing it, pacing back and forth, waving some kind of book or waving tree bark or have a, holding up a frog, and they continue to talk about this thing. And now it seems so serious. And from another, if we were childish, from a, I'll speak for ordinary intelligence and say, well, wait a minute. There's got to be something to religion, the idea of a God. Yeah, why? Well, because everybody talks about it. It's just everywhere. And so you think, well, no, they showed me up again. No. The more you talk about something, the more serious it sounds. If it was serious, why would you have to talk about it? If it was serious, why wouldn't there be that one announcement? The voice comes on, whether it was H.B. Calton born or not, but to jump back from last time we were taping, it says, special announcement, the world is coming to an end in 27 minutes. I have nothing else to say. How serious is that? Now, if it was serious, they wouldn't just make the announcement go off the air. That's some kind of joke. It's worse than Wells redone. We're back to that old game. Now, if it was serious, they're going to say, we just discovered a meteor is going to hit us in 27 minutes. Can you believe that? Wait a minute. Let's call in a panel. Here's some of my fellow reporters. Come in here. And everybody would be talking as fast as they could about talking about serious. <laughs> now, we're going to have to interrupt. Now, we're going to play some Bob and Ray records here, the Prairie Home Companion. <laughs> but we're going to have to skip that tonight because this is serious. But if they just said the world's coming in in 27 minutes, good night, we're signing off now. You think, well, that's a joke. Because if it's serious, people are going to talk about it, right? Try it another way. If they talk about it and talk about it, it becomes serious. We have absolutely run out tonight. If it makes you feel any better, I was going so many places going to try to drag you with it that we'll pick this up next time we're taping. Somewhere. Because we need to talk more about it. <laughs> of course, some of the little things I mentioned I can just do, but you know, when it gets to be serious, we're, I need to, of course, go into it much in much more detail, so we'll pick it up Monday. <laughs> End of public meeting. <laughs> Back on. I just want to say a little something. It keeps popping up, and it. I let it go for a long time and don't mention it. But you people out there, even in the other cities and here, I cannot run your life in the group. I certainly can't run it out in life, and plus I got no interest. You know, those of you that maybe stumbled in here and thought you were getting into some kind of commune or around the guru and take over your life, if you notice, if there is, if you like to notice the opposites and in the 3D world, if anything, this is just the opposite. Not only do I got no desire to run your external life, I don't even have any interest in your external life. <laughs> well, don't feel bad. I got none in mine, so why should I have any in yours? <laughs> so, well, listen, we... And so I, but and I cannot run it in here. Now I've tried. I have established some absolute rules, and you people out there know it, or you should know it, that you can't be expressing hostility amongst people here in the group. Not for any reason. Not for any moral reason. Not because the gods will smile on you. Just don't do it. If you do it, I just have to throw you out. It's just a matter of economics. It's a matter that you're wasting your time. And I point out there can't be just unbridled sexual intrigues and flirting going on. Good old-fashioned fucking. I don't care about to say the least. That is, in a, in a negative way. I got no complaint about that. But, you know, sexual intrigues and games, that kind of thing is the same thing as hostility, pulling just the group. This would not be going on. Now the point. You people should be triply, quadruply, and then some careful about doing any kind of business with each other. And we've got all sorts of people here and in the groups out of town getting this of diverse occupations and interests, and I know, this is nothing s strange at all, how easy it is and how even appropriate it would seem at times that you know that somebody in the group 
is either in some business of which you could avail yourself, or else maybe they know somebody. You find out somebody's brother-in-law or somebody's good friend repairs computers or something, and you really need it. And they say, well, get me a discount. Or you find he gets a discount. And you end up and you get cheated. You feel cheated. Something goes awry, and then you have either directly or indirectly, now you feel as though somebody in the group has hurt you that they should have known better. They shouldn't have recommended it. Or maybe you just ask somebody, where do you get your car fixed? Where do you, you know, do you know a good barber, a hairdresser? Be careful. And I know you're also, many of you, wired up that it feels in a certain way and not without any basis. It's not that it's invalid, but that you begin to feel closer to many people in here than you do a lot of people in life. And you tend to think, well, somebody in here would not mislead me. If somebody recommended something, I would you know, take it seriously. Or if I actually did business with somebody in here, I would think out of the whole world, if somebody here in the group, in one of the groups out of town, if I paid somebody to come build me a porch, if somebody said that they were a carpenter, I would expect that somebody here in the group, and they said, I'll have it done by the first of next month, that somebody in the group would do it if they broke both arms, if it rained day and night, that if anybody in the world would do it, somebody would here. Everybody is human. And I know that some of you people skate on the edge. Some of you almost get in fist fights. And it's probably just, in a sense, fear that I'd find out. And part of it is you feel like that it is, perhaps by now, that it is unprofitable for you to get involved in a negative way with somebody in here. The thing is, try your best since I cannot look after him, and I don't really want to make a rule that you people just ignore each other out in the ordinary world, but you should be extremely careful doing business with each other. Extremely. And all of you are wired up differently. Some of you, you get in business deals, and one of you feel like you've been cheated, and the other one, what you feel as of being cheated, the other person takes as being like a fly. That, you know, that's the way life is. And it's not right or wrong. But just by being around here, and just by being in some way at least you could avail yourself of my great influence. That does not mean, as you should be aware, you got to do is look around and open your eyes, as you always should, that everybody in this group has suddenly become, in some way, the epitome of all-knowing intelligence, all-encompassing decency and fairness. That is, according to your definition, which is the only definition that matters. I'm not questioning that. But everybody in this group has not become what you dreamed of as being Superman. Are you? It is dangerous. In a real sense, it frightens me. I know it goes on, and it just little things pop up, and things pop up that some of you think I don't know about, and I can feel it going on. Just watch it. I, of course, I'm trying to give you a suggestion that you be very careful. Think two or three times about doing business with each other. Because you can end up, it's up to you, if you end up in that position, but you end up having a real hard feeling experience with somebody in this group and it could swell up to such a point that you might drop out, I might have to throw you out, the other person, both of you, just tell you to leave. And was that worth it just so that you could apparently start off with and get uh, whatever it was, wholesale? <laughs> Think a long time. Now some of you, uh, there is, it's useless, it's silly, it's three-dimensional to make an absolute rule to say don't any of you do it because some of you now can deal with each other almost as though you're your own brother. But there are many of you who can't. And it's not your fault. It's not anybody's particular fault. It's the way that things are wired up. It's the way that some of you are wired up. And you do not have the same sense of fairness, of decency, of justice. Nobody does. There's a time and there's a tempo in everybody's own nervous system and you people are playing a dangerous game. Just think about it. When you do business with each other, when it gets into money, and I'm depending on you that I, I cannot live, I won't be able to operate unless you do what you told me you'd do next Thursday. Oh yeah, you can count on me. And they leave town. Oh, yeah, I forgot about it. And you feel just absolutely crushed. You feel like, well, this is worse than some shade tree mechanic that botched up doing my tune-up, this was somebody here in the group. I would have crawled on my hands and knees on hot asphalt to get back if I'd promised to do you something. And that person thinks, yeah, you probably would. 
<laughs> well, how could you treat me like that? I will say anybody who really feels as though, and out there, you people in the other cities, hi to everybody. As long as this means something to you, then you mean as much to me as anybody in the world. Even those of you I haven't even met. And so I do care. If you care, if this is what you need, if this is what you like, then I care. And I'm saying it's very dangerous. And it frightens me and it should frighten you. And you should just be doubly, triply careful as much as possible. Keep yourself at arm's length with people here. That's just the safest course. It's just... Treat everybody as though they were a long-lost relative or they're a rich uncle that may die and leave you unlimited wealth. But, bet but between here and the grave, you better not piss them off. Just think about it. Well, you know, when I'm more in my aggressive mood, I can say, you know, don't piss me off. You know, if you really like this because it's good to be king, because all I got to do is say, you know, don't come back. Think about that, not just me, but think about that you can end up doing that to yourself just over the possibility, and as nice as it sounds, of trying to get a better deal, trying to get something wholesale. If you can help each other, fine. But you should be very, very careful. Now, a bunch of you already know this, because many of you feel, although as somebody else, it may be a relatively minor thing, and you may think you're over it. And some of you, I know some things have happened in the past that you thought was pretty big, that somebody in this group just really did you in. And what's really worse, of course, is you look around and apparently they didn't take it as seriously as you. Which don't mean that they were right and you were wrong. Be careful. Take this seriously. I would not have talked about it. <laughs> Bye to everybody. Especially to Miami. Thanks a lot. You realize it's September up here? <laughs> it's raining. Well, even Los Angeles. Plus, I, I want to know something. How come Los Angeles is about on the same latitude as Atlanta, and how come it stays warm up there? I even got a book from the library one time and tried to find that. It was, I forget, it was on uh, pottery or something. But here, anyway, I, I went to the library, I got a down a book. It didn't tell me anything. Of course, New York, I don't worry about because I know it's colder up there. So. You have my sympathy. Bye.